thyroid, the thyroid is that powerhouse. It is literally the CEO of your metabolism. It is so critical, so important, so valuable because it is literally what governs your expenditure of calories. If you want to burn a bunch of calories, your thyroid better be working optimally. If you want to have all that energy that you want and desire to do all those things that you love to do, going for a walk, going for a run, swim, bike, whatever that looks like, climb mountains, like whatever. For me, it's surfing, biking, skiing, snowboarding a few months from now, whatever that is, I want to be able to do these things Till the end, tell them at least 100, right? That's the goal to be the first surfer. That's my goal, personal goal, to be the first surfer to continue to surf to 100 years old. It's never been done before. And to be able to do that, I need to have a properly functioning metabolism. And certainly that CEO, that governor of my metabolism, the thyroid gland needs to be working optimally. So I got to be careful. I got to watch out for a few things because there are snakes in the grass, right? <laughs> there are goitrogens out there. And we didn't really get into this last week. And somebody mentioned, hey, you didn't talk too much about goitrogen. So what the heck is a goitrogen? Well, it's just any compound that can interfere with the normal function of the thyroid gland. And we, you know, comes from that same uh, root there, goiter, which is that swelling of the thyroid, that swelling in the anterior neck there. You know, thyroid's kind of like the bow tie that's sitting over your anterior neck, right where that Adam's apple is. It's over on the left and on the right, looks a little bit like a bow tie or a butterfly. And if it's not working well, if you have um, been exposed to goitrogens, which could block the iodine from getting to the thyroid, the thyroid has an amazing ability to concentrate iodine because it is crucial and critical and absolutely necessary to produce thyroid hormone. You have to have iodine in your diet. And a couple hundred years ago, there were lots of places that were deficient, right? Especially those mountainous areas that were nowhere near the coast. Fortunately, uh, I spend a lot of time near the coast. I get plenty of seafood. I love all things seafood. And so my levels are good, but there are folks that don't get exposed to it in their food so much. And so a low thyroid situation or hypothyroid can be, even present day, can be still caused um, by a low iodine in the diet. And so replacing that with adequate amount, which is actually pretty easy to do. And since 1924, I think much of the salt that has been used, at least here in the US, has been added um, to have potassium iodide or KI. In fact, there was this funny saying, uh, I don't know if I can find it. I wrote it down because it was cracking me up. Oh, here it is. It says, quote, if you don't know where, what, and why, then prescribe K and I. And K, of course, is potassium. That's on the periodic table. K is potassium. And then I is for iodine. And back in the day, 1924, I think, was when Morton Salt, um, those of you watching over on YouTube, I have a, a thing here of it because it's such a funny um, caricature there with the gal in the rain and the salt is sort of being dumped. I don't know why they chose that super weird, but it seems like it's been like that forever. Iodized salt. And so they were starting to add that to salt and many other things here in the U.S. And so our levels just as a country are now adequate, but there's certainly some cases, even in the U.S. here at home, that people suffer from low thyroid or hypothyroid from low levels of iodine. And one of the reasons right here and now I'm going to share with you is because of these goitrogens. And goitrogens, as I mentioned, are any compounds that can interfere with the normal functioning of the thyroid gland. So that's everything from the toxins that we are exposed to, right? We've talked um, quite a bit in the past about different toxins that uh, sadly many of us are exposed to, things like BPA, bisphenol A, which of course is in plastics, and that's why I'm not drinking out of a plastic water bottle. Mine here, as you can see here on YouTube, is glass. And, uh, you know, I'm not perfect if I'm traveling and that's the only thing they have on the plane is water out of plastic. I'll drink it out of plastic, but certainly I'm not buying on purpose plastic uh, containing water bo bottles with BPA. I'm watching out for the lining in cans. If I buy canned things that don't have BPA, for example, because BPA phthalates also in many of our cosmetics, shampoos, conditioners, vinyl chloride, also in plastics, pesticides, of course, herbicides, such as that, uh, heaven forbid, Roundup that's still being used. You can still buy it at Home Depot and before I knew how potent, dangerous, and terrible this was, I used to buy it. I'm so embarrassed to admit it, but <laughs> I've bought that before in my life, but not in the last couple of decades. And anyway, um, polychlorinated biphenols or PCBs, the uh, per <coughs> fluoro 
octanoic acid from Teflon. Like if you got Teflon pans, please toss those. I know they're so convenient, but they are no good. They are no good. They contain these disruptors, these so-called endocrine disruptors or goitrogens here when referring to the thyroid because they mess with thyroid function and you don't want that. So try to limit your exposure to these things. There's also some foods out there that have potential goitrogen um, activity or anti-thyroid activity. And I will talk about this because I feel like this could be a little controversial. There's definitely, uh, I'll just say health influencers out there, even, even doctors like me that, uh, um, are really doing their best to share this health knowledge with you. There's, there's some out there that are hardcore carnivores and, and I, I don't have any problem with anybody who's a carnivore, because if that's what makes you thrive and you are truly thriving, do whatever is keeping you and making you thrive. Uh, personally, for me, I although I do eat meat and I love all kinds of meat, I have to have some veggies too. I actually love my veggies. And one of the classes of veggies that I personally love that is a potential goitrogen are the cruciferous vegetables. These are things like, of course, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, uh, my favorite, Brussels, sprouts, and they have some potential activity. Another one here in Hawaii that I'm familiar with is bok choy. Uh, it's found also in the um, kimchi or the local uh, version, kind of like the Hawaiian sauerkraut Korea is where the, uh, the recipe, I think, comes from. And it comes from that. But that can be a potential goitrogen if you overdo it. Now, most people are not overdoing it with things like kimchi or broccoli or cauliflower, right? A lot of people don't eat enough of these cruciferous vegetables. So it's usually not an issue. But if you talk to those health influencers that are, you know, full on carnivore, if you will, they may tell you, oh, here's a reason to never eat broccoli again, or here's a reason to never have Brussels sprouts or kale or whatever it is, because they have the potential to block some activity at the thyroid gland. One that uh, I think is even more important to pay attention to is in soy, because soy not only is a potential goitrogen, but also it has a significant potential to be an anti-nutrient. So blocks the absorption of important nutrients, and that's from phytates or phytic acid. This is generally in the soy that is not fermented, not fermented. And so I enjoy the soy that is fermented. These are things like uh, the tempeh and tofu. And um, if you've ever had miso soup, this is all fermented. Um, and so the potential for anti-nutrients or even the lectins that are found in soy um, diminishes greatly with fermentation. So if you like these fermented soy products like tempeh, tofu, um, natto, or even the miso soup that I love so much, I wouldn't worry about it because it's fermented. And so the anti-nutrients, the phytic acid, the potential goitrogens shouldn't really be a problem. Um, but if you're down in gallons and gallons of soy milk, that could be an issue. I actually stopped drinking soy milk a couple of years back because I was aware of these endocrine disrupting activity, um, not only with thyroid, but potentially lowering testosterone and other things. So I don't drink any soy milk anymore uh, because of that, the endocrine disruption potential, as well as the anti-nutrient potential with the phytic acid there. Um, some other potential goitrogens in food, um, bamboo shoots, cassava, uh, millet, um, what else? Uh, some sweet potatoes, pine nuts, uh, turnips, uh, spinach, um, mustard greens, horseradish, collard greens, uh, cabbage. And I mentioned all these things mostly before, but I like to eat uh, them fermented. And so this doesn't usually pose a problem and usually doesn't pose a problem unless you were eating three meals a day of, of kale or something like that. And, you know, who does that? Right. I mean, I might have it once in a while, once a week or what have you, but I'm not eating three meals a day of this stuff. I'm not even eating three meals a day of cauliflower or broccoli, although I know it has significant health enhancing effects, especially with liver health and detoxification. So I haven't stopped eating any of these uh, potentially goitrogenic foods other than I don't drink soy milk any anymore. And I actually rarely have, um, I rarely <clears throat> have sweet potatoes because they just 
they boost my blood sugar. I, I, I've worn a, a CGM and the foods that really jack with it, I just kind of stop eating. Corn uh, is one as well. I don't eat much corn because, uh, you know, it's just hard to get good quality corn. Corn, <laughs> I did a funny uh, podcast. Uh, well, this segment I thought was kind of funny with JJ Virgin, who she is all things health. I mean, she is amazing. I think she's like 60 now. I mean, she looks 20 years younger. She's amazing. She's super fit. She's one of the health gurus out there. And she made this comment that corn is not a vegetable. I mean, most of the corn we have nowadays is GMO and it's not high quality. And it, and often, and even in my family members, uh, boosts blood sugar. So we don't have corn much uh, unless we can verify it's well sourced. And so I, I don't really eat much corn. So that's not really an issue for me. Um, and if you're cooking your food, these, you know, especially like your uh, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, et cetera, you're cooking it. Um, or if you even ferment it, like with the soy products we talked about, you shouldn't really have to worry about goitrogenic activity. So the, if you eat a bunch of it raw, like tons of raw kale, you're making three smoothies a day, you might definitely want to be watching out for that and just kind of vary your diet. Like I always say, variety is the spice of life, not only for you, but for the gut too. We love variety. <laughs> also, if you happen to eat foods that have iodine, it kind of blocks this potential uh, goitrogenic activity because one of the ways that they mess with thyroid is by blocking absorption of iodine. So if you have foods that have iodine in them, like kelp, you like nori, um, you like uh, sushi, right? It has kelp there. If you like, uh, like I do fish and, and crustaceans and shellfish and things like that, uh, plenty of iodine there. So as long as you're getting enough iodine in the diet, as well as selenium, selenium is great to support thyroid function. You know, that's available in Brazil nuts. You only need a couple a day type of thing. Um, but also it's in meat and in tofu, sunflower seeds, uh, portobello mushrooms, um, some cheeses as well. We'll also have uh, sources of selenium. Selenium and zinc are important for thyroid function. But as mentioned, if you're having uh, sufficient iodine in your diet, you like seafood or you like kelp or kombu, nori, et cetera, um, I don't think you'll need to worry at all about these potential goitrogenic effects of the cruciferous vegetables, because most of us don't even eat enough of them. <laughs> and so I wouldn't really worry about that, although those... Uh, uh, famous carnivores out there will tell you, oh my gosh, you should never have a vegetable. And, you know, if they're thriving that way, that's fine. But I just found that most people could benefit from some vegetables in their life. <laughs> Although definitely we can benefit from a good, healthy protein sources as well, which is why I eat both. I'm just certainly uh, well described as an omnivore. I'm omnivorous. Um, but the bottom line is with these potentially goitrogenic foods, I wouldn't worry about them much. Like I said, I wouldn't be downing a ton of almond milk, uh, but most of the other things, as long as you're um, not eating crazy ridiculous amounts of them and you're varying your diet, and if you even eat them fermented, even better. And if you're making sure you get enough iodine in your diet, you shouldn't really have to worry. In fact, uh, the issues now with iodine deficiency, thankfully, are much, much less than they used to be. In fact, I shared with you last week, um, the stats on this, and let me just pull up the chart again. This was the most recent population uh, study was 2021, and this was worldwide here. And this was from the, uh, um, uh, what was it here? Hold on. I just pulled up uh, the global scorecard of iodine nutrition in 2021. And this showed that at that point in time, the overwhelming majority of the data showed that most folks are getting well, five countries surveyed had adequate iodine, um, 18 of them insufficient, and then excess was only nine out of those 130 some odd. So um, there is becoming a few years back, we had zero with the excess, but I think now that we have iodized uh, salt, like I mentioned, starting in 1924, and a lot of countries have made it their public health mission to make sure they have enough iodine, which is great. It's a great thing. And I'm very, very happy that we've made that movement so that we don't have issues with developmental delay, both in the brain health, you know, that we're not having cretinism uh, affect us, uh, very much anymore, as well as stunted growth. I mean, there were literally people that were four feet tall and that were very, very much delayed uh, mentally from lack of iodine, both in, in utero, their mothers weren't getting up and then they didn't get enough. And so this was 
a terrible, horrible, horrible situation. And it was very much common a hundred or so years ago. Um, and it has been an issue for thousands of years until people figured it out that iodine actually fixed that. You could eat the uh, thyroid gland of another animal if you wanted, or you could eat the seafood and things. And so finally we got this all dialed in. And I think for the most part, present day, we're doing a pretty good job with this, but you can overdo it. So we'll talk in a moment about supplementation because there is a couple of, of things I want to share there that I didn't get a chance to last week about supplementation because sometimes people overdo it and it is pretty easy to do so with one of the very common uh, supplements that is out there. I'll just uh, uh, mention that now since I'm thinking about it, I don't want to forget but the Lugol's uh, solution um, called Lugol, L-U-G-O-L, Lugol's solution is super concentrated. And what I found is that it's not easy to get the right dose with that. So I've, I've definitely have seen people that can overdose on the Lugol solution. The others that are available, just simple uh, potassium iodide drops or kelp tablets. I, I kind of recommend the kelp tablets from dried seaweed because you're pretty much never going to overdose on that. It's pretty darn hard to, or the typical potassium iodide drops have about a hundred mics per drop. So usually it's about one to two drops. Um, I've even given my uh, kids that to make sure because uh, we checked and they had surprisingly a little bit low because actually these couple of kids, they didn't like, they, they don't like seafood that much. They're not like me. They don't love, love, love seafood. We got a couple that love it and a couple that really don't. So typical drops are usually uh, safe. Usually it's one or two drops, but avoid the Lugol's L-U-G-O, LS. And, and you'll know because I, I've seen this stuff. It kind of looks like it should be in a chemistry lab. It is super, super dark. It's staining. I mean, it literally looks like something you would use in a chemistry lab or even um, paint on, you know, paint on a wound or something because it is very concentrated. And so that's the one I don't recommend and it's super readily available. So I hope I'm not upsetting anybody, but I just want to throw that out there. I've seen this cause, uh, uh, high levels of iodine, which is not a good thing. So, cause that actually will stop the thyroid uh, from producing adequate thyroid hormone. If you overdo it, right. That's the acute treatment. We talked about that um, for a rip roaring hyperthyroid situation. You actually give people iodine and lots and lots of it. And that actually stops thyroid function. So that's what happens if you give too much, but the kelp tablets, I found them to be safe and the simple potassium iodide drops, usually one or two drops is sufficient. Um, the other thing that's super helpful with getting your um, functioning of your thyroid gland, making the thyroid hormone and being able to utilize the iodine you get in your diet, of course, is getting your gut healthy. Your gut is where the iodine will get absorbed. Also, it's super important because the conversion of the thyroid hormone, which is thyroxine, that's T4, into the active form T3, up to 20% or more can happen at the level of your gut by the bacteria in your gut that can actually help you to get this active thyroid form. And so I found that to be super beneficial to help. In fact, many people who have improved their gut health, their low thyroid situations have significantly improved. So that's one thing I love to focus on. And there's a really great article from the journal Nutrients in 2020 that talks about the thyroid gut axis. And so I'd encourage you to read that. It talks all about uh, how to optimize your gut, how to get that gut working for you to help activate that uh, thyroid hormone from the T4, which is the thyroxine into the active form which is T3. And remember, most of that thyroid hormone that's produced in the thyroid gland is actually the T4 stuff. That's how most of it gets produced. Some of it will be converted right at the level of thyroid into T3. Um, most of it is converted also in the liver. So you want your liver to be up and running really, really well. You don't want to have inflammation going on in the liver. And many people do from what's called autoimmune hepatitis or from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is now the number one cause of liver transplant in the world. And it's basically entirely preventable, right? We know that that happens from basically too much sugar, too much high fructose corn syrup, way too many processed foods, especially sugars in the diet, processed foods, processed grains, glutens, and things like that, that overwhelm the liver with inflammation. This inflammation wreaks havoc on the thyroid by virtue of causing inflammation there at the level of the thyroid, the level of the brain, the hypothalamus, which controls everything as the control center. And then of course, at the level of the liver, which is needed to convert that T4 or thyroxine, the thyroid hormone into the active version, T3, 
T3. So sorry for all the alphabet soup, but the bottom line with that is the importance of getting your gut healthy. So you can not only absorb the iodine in your diet, but also get the thyroid hormone activated, converting that T4 into T3, which can happen very, very well at the level of the gut. And while we're talking about a little bit about iodine replacement, we talked about don't use the Lugol solution because that's just too concentrated and it's just too hard to get the right amount. It's easy to do a minor, you know, miscalculation, add a couple of drops and you can just get too much. And it can happen pretty quickly over a couple of weeks or a month or two. You can really uh, get way too much and that can actually block the, the thyroid uh, gland from producing thyroid hormone. As I mentioned, too much of it is not a good thing. So it's like the Goldilocks phenomenon. A lot of things is that not too little, not too much. You got to have just the right amount. And that can be done with diet and with uh, potassium iodide drops or the kelp tablets if you need them. But you got to check under the hood. If you really want to know, you got to do a urinary iodide uh, test. And that's a simple, simple test. You just pee in a cup, send it off, and you can get what your level is there. So you have an idea of where you are starting from. But some benefits, folks that may have a low-grade um hypo or low functioning thyroid, hypothyroid can benefit from a little bit of iodine replacement. In fact, I've seen this uh, help about a third of people that have a low-ish thyroid function, which may be demonstrated by a TSH that's a little elevated, say like in the two to three to four range, which sadly on a blood test, your doctor may not even notice that because up to about 4.5 or so, I just tested somebody this past week. And it was actually with a really good lab that I really like that does a lot of these sort of holistic, integrative, personalized health testing. And their normal level for TSH, that thyroid stimulated hormone, stimulating hormone was all the way up to 4.5. They consider that normal. And, and it may be normal by sort of an average over the population, but it's not, it's not optimal. And so an optimal thyroid hormone uh, level, excuse me, a TSH thyroid stimulating hormone level, TSH level would be from about 0 0.5 to about, uh, excuse me, 0 0.2 to about 1.5 is more of an optimal level, 0 0.2 to 1.5 micro, uh, micro units per liter. And that's what you want to shoot for. If it's over 1.5, it's in the 1.7, 1 1.8, 2, 3, 4 range, even though it reads normal on the test and won't necessarily be flagged. Hopefully your doctor is astute enough to see that, or they share those results with you. And nowadays they usually do that. So you can take a look, um, get a look under the hood, get the test done. And if that TSH is above 1.5 and you're having symptoms of, you know, stubborn, uh, weight loss that you can't get off that uh, few pounds that you want to, your metabolism seems a little bit slowed. You're having some cold intolerance and you're just not feeling quite yourself. Maybe you have cold hands and feet, your energy's low, you know, weight gain, or you just can't lose that stubborn weight or, you know, a little bit of swelling in your legs, these kinds of things. And the sad thing is a doc, you know, traditional Western trained doc might just look at your TSH of four and say, oh, well, it can't be your thyroid. Eh, BS, ah, that's wrong. <laughs> TSH of four. I would say, hey, you're not done yet. You got to be getting your T3, your T4, and the free, the free levels in the blood, because that's the ones that are available to bind to the receptors. You want the free T4, the free T3. You want the reverse T3. I explained all of this uh, last week, but you can reach out to me as well if you have questions. You got to get a look under the hood. You got to know these things. And it's not just a simple TSH. And sadly, that's where most doctors stop. They're testing. They just do a TSH and nothing else. And that's not sufficient. And most of them don't even interpret the TSH correctly because if you had a TSH of three, technically it says it's normal, but you're having symptoms, right? If you have cold intolerance, weight gain, or stubborn weight loss, low energy, maybe even depressed mood, some swelling in your feet, you may actually end up with something you don't need. You may end up with a prescription for a diuretic or a antidepressant. And that's not really the issue. The real issue could be an underfunctioning thyroid, but you'll only know if you get the whole panel, you get all the tests because you need to include things like reverse T3, as well as of course, the free T3, the free T4, the anti um, bodies that you want to look for that could cause, you know, inflammation of your thyroid, like the TPO, the thyroid peroxidase, the antithyroglobulin, um, you got to get those antibodies as well, because a lot of people, in fact, one of the most common reasons for thyroid issues is a condition called Hashimoto's, which we talked about last week, which can send these antibody levels up 
And these are something to monitor over time as you're doing interventions to decrease inflammation, right? Like changing your diet, getting rid of the gluten, getting rid of the grains, getting rid of those highly processed foods and sugars and, and the goitrogens as well, you know, that we talked about, whether it be through the different chemical pollutants or the toxins we're exposed to on a daily basis um, that we can avoid, you know, with, you know, changing up our diet, getting organic foods instead of the ones with pesticides or, you know, just not eating the highly processed foods. Uh, those kinds of things, staying away from the plastics and whatnot that we talk about with the BPA and the vinyl chlorides and things like that. And so really important to check under the hood. You got to take a look. And then if you need to restore a little bit of iodine in the diet, you know, you can do the diet first or you can do the drops that we talked about. Not, not, not the Lugol's ones, but the regular potassium iodide drops or the kelp tablets, because what's cool about when you have sufficient levels of iodine is that not only is it much more likely that your thyroid will function well, but also it can protect you from potential toxins out there. Because if you have looked at the periodic table lately, which you may not have, uh, <laughs> iodine is in the halogen um, uh, column. And so other things in that column, such as fluorine, chlorine, bromine, you know, these are pretty toxic things. If you have an adequate supply of iodine, it can actually block your body's uptake of some of these dangerous chemicals like the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, for example, which are everywhere from drinking water to swimming pools, herbicide residues, all kinds of places. Um, and so one of the benefits of having your iodine sufficient is it can block the absorption of these more toxic, uh, similar compounds, similar elements in that same column of the periodic table, right? The halogens. <laughs> Who knew that we were going to talk about the periodic table this week? Oh my goodness. But like I said, don't worry about um, having some of these potentially goitrogenic foods in your diet, like the cruciferous vegetables. My favorite are, of course, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the Brussels sprouts, the asparagus, etc. Don't worry about these if you are also eating uh, appropriate amounts of the iodine itself, right? And seafood, or maybe you're doing the replacement and the kelp tablets or what have you. I wouldn't worry too much about the, um, the uh, cruciferous vegetables, okay? As long as you're getting adequate iodine. And the other thing that's kind of cool that most people don't know about is, and I actually, I'll be honest, I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago by a really renowned dude who studies the thyroid. He even developed the whole society of thyroid medicine. And even he didn't mention this, which kind of bummed me out, but Thyroid, of course, um, the most important uh, element there is the iodine. Yes, that's super important. But he basically said, that's all it does. It only, it only affects the thyroid, nothing else. And like, that's the main role. Absolutely. Iodine's main role is to be able to help you make thyroid hormone, right? You need four of them to be able to make T4, three to make T3. And it starts as a T4, then it goes to a T3. And so you got to have iodine around. And that's the number one most important role for iodine in the body. But also it seems to have a role in preventing some what's called fibrocystic breast disease, which is generally felt to be a precursor to breast cancer. And so folks that had adequate iodine levels tended to have less of this precancerous condition. So it's actually been recommended to make sure you got your levels intact to also prevent this, which may be a precursor to breast cancer. Another area which I thought was pretty interesting is that the iodine can actually potentially be protective for good oral health, oral hygiene, the hygiene, the teeth and so on, because it actually gets concentrated in the salivary glands, which acts as a little bit of an antimicrobial. And there's a bunch of nasty bugs that can live in your mouth. And so having adequate iodine may actually help with uh, optimal oral health and less tooth decay. And, and many of you know that inflammation in your mouth, like gingivitis, for example, can be a precursor to inflammation other places in your body, even things like heart disease. So super important. You can't ignore your oral health, right? You got to blur up brush, you got to floss, you got to do those things because you have to get your oral health up to speed so that you don't potentially cause downstream issues like cardiovascular inflammation and heart disease because they are actually related. So you don't want inflammation and iodine may be actually one of the things that could help you with oral health because it has been known to concentrate there in the salivary glands and it gets excreted so that kind of kills off some of the unwanted, unnecessary and unhelpful, you know, microbes that are not awesome for your health. So it actually keeps them at bay. And of course, uh, many of you um, have been around a while and know that iodine has been used for, geez, hundreds of years to treat wounds and to get rid of those bad bacteria, if you will. In fact, I, I'll be honest, I even used a little bit today. I had a nasty 
uh, scra scrape on my leg that, that uh, just wanted to make sure it was cleaned really good. I don't clean it with iodine every single day, but on the first clean, I usually try to do it once and get rid of everything on the first go. And then, and then I'll use a little silver spray after that, which is pretty cool and helpful and less kind of kind of toxic iodine um, can be pretty potent. So I don't want to put that on the wound each and every day because it kills the healing or granulating tissue as well, the good cells and the bad cells. And so you don't want to use that every single day, but for a first pass, when you just have a fresh wound to clean it really good, in fact, that's what we use right before surgery. We use some iodine to clean the skin really good to prep it prior to that. And so iodine is a good thing. <laughs> and so make sure you have adequate. It's not only good for the thyroid, of course, and thyroid hormone, but for breast health and or Oral health, who knew? It is not just the thyroid. <laughs> so um, check under the hood, do the urine uh, iodide test so you'll know. Um, we already talked about the testing to get to check your thyroid hormones levels. That is not sufficient to only get a TSH. You want to get the free T4, the free T3, the antithyroglobulin, the, anti, uh, the other antibody, the uh, thyroid peroxidase, uh, as well as the reverse T3, which is so important. And I never met a single doctor in Western medicine that was testing for this in a thyroid panel, which bums me out. I've seen them check it in the ICU before, because as mentioned in the previous podcast, this tends to go up when you're under significant stress. Cortisol also raises the reverse T3, which is basically the brakes on the whole system. It blocks the active thyroid uh, hormone T3. It blocks it. And so if you have too much reverse T3, you can be hypo or low functioning thyroid. So you got to check, you got to check under the hood. And what I wanted to also emphasize with the treatment is that you need to pay attention to your numbers in the follow-up, you know, every three to four weeks, if you're changing dose on your medication, et cetera. If you don't have a thyroid, like my, my stepmom who had thyroid cancer, um, she has to take a replacement. And I actually called her because I wanted to make sure that she was taking both T4 and the T3 together. And that's available as either armor thyroid or natural thyroid and not available in Synthroid, which is one of the most commonly prescribed medications in the world, Synthroid, which is only T4. And most doctors prescribe Synthroid, which is only T4. It does not have any of the active thyroid in there, the T3 and these others that I just mentioned, the armor thyroid and the nature thyroid, those actually have a combination of T3 and T4, which I found to be much more helpful, much more effective. And so take a look at what you're getting and make sure you get a combo uh, treatment with T3 and T4. Usually that's going to be nature thyroid or armor thyroid like my, uh, like my, uh, my stepmom takes because she doesn't have a thyroid anymore. Her gland was actually removed and she's done really well with the armor thyroid. And so what's, what's sad about this is of course the Synthroid, right? It's a big pharmaceutical. It's been available for a long time. It's been marketed as, oh, this is the most pure. It has all the T4 you need, none of the T3, just the T4. And they, they actually were, were, you know, I'm mean, not that it's never been done, right? The, the companies were kind of, they were being very deceptive. I mean, I, I feel like they were frankly lying to physicians telling them that it was better because it was it was pure pure t4 and it's better for your body and that's actually not true it's not true in fact there's data showing that the t3 t4 combinations work better and in fact uh, there was even i forget what year it was there was even a time where they had to be scolded a bit which was i thought pretty cool because the fda i feel like maybe doesn't do enough scolding to these drug companies that maybe need it they had to get a little scolding the Synthroid uh, folks had to get a little scolding from the FDA because they were making false claims that that it was better, that, that Synthroid or T4 or thyroxine was better than a combination T3 and T4. And they were basically telling physicians to not prescribe the other type, uh, probably because it was not going to give them business. It's uh, less expensive. And theirs, of course, had to be better, but that's just not the case. And they were actually told to kind of cease and desist and... Uh, I thought that was kind of cool. The FDA told them, hey, you guys can't do that. You're making false claims. And so uh, the moral of the story is I uh, feel like the data is in your favor if you get a combination. And, and it is there. But the other thing is it works in real time because not everyone's conversion, peripheral conversion of T4 to T3 is exactly impeccable, right? We we talk about the main areas that this happens, which is in the liver. So if you have any liver inflammation going on, you're not going to convert the T4 into the active form T3 as readily. If you don't have optimal gut health, that's at least, you know, in a 
about the 20% uh, conversion happens over there. So one fifth of the conversion happens in your gut. And that's been documented in the literature as well. And so if your gut isn't healthy, you're going to lose that helpful uh, ability to get active thyroid hormone or T3 in the gut. And so I typically recommend folks that have to take thyroid replacement like my stepmom. And I'm so grateful that she's on the right one. She figured it out uh, pretty early on. And I just wanted to double check with her last week that she's still taking that. And she hasn't been convinced by her doctor to take Synthroid or just the thyroxin instead. And fortunately, that's not happening with her. She's still taking the armor of thyroid, which I was very grateful to find out. And so there's another myth buster. One, one more. Oh, I forgot about a, a kind of funny myth buster that uh, I was thinking about when I cleaned my wound um, with iodine the other day, because uh, what happens, there was this study done, gosh, it's been over 50 years, maybe even 75 years, where um, there was this misconception that if you were low on iodine and you paint your skin you know, with that dark brownish colored iodine uh, preparation, that you would uh, absorb it more quickly. And that, you know, in 24, 48 hours where you painted your skin, that that yellowish color would kind of go away. And in those that uh, <laughs> didn't have a, a iodine deficiency, you wouldn't uh, notice that uh, yellowish color disappear because you wouldn't be soaking it in. And so they did a test on basically people who were low in thyroid, or, or I should say low in iodine, those who had adequate iodine. And then a third group was cadaver skin. So literally dead people. And they found no difference in these three groups in how this, it was more haphazard. It wasn't because the color disappeared if you were low in iodine. It didn't work out the way they thought. So if somebody tells you that and say, hey, do this overnight and see, that is, it doesn't work. So <laughs> just check under the hood. You got to do that urinary iodide test, uh, which is readily available. Just got to pee in a cup and not hard to do. So that was the gist of what I wanted to share this week. I wanted to make sure you understood what goitrogens were. I wanted to talk about thyroid hormone replacement. If like my stepmom has basically had hers both radi radioactively removed and then surgically removed, she has to be on thyroid replacement and she takes the T3 and the T4 combination, which is really what I recommend for most people because I just don't see a benefit to the T4 only. Um, you know, if you have low thyroid function, you want to make sure you're getting optimal function and that includes having sufficient T3, but you got to do all the tests. Yeah. You got to follow the numbers, the free T3, the free T4, the TSH, the reverse T3, and of course the TPO and the antithyroglobulin uh, antibody levels. You got to do the test and just remember that just because your doc says your TSH is normal, if it's like 3.5 or four, and it still says normal on the lab, that's not normal because you can still have symptoms. Certainly and optimal is what you're shooting for. We want optimal health, not just normal, you know, crappy health that most people have because in nine out of 10 of us present day have significant metabolic challenges. Insulin resistance is about nine out of 10 people and some version of inflammation that's ongoing with chronicity that's happening regularly and daily is about this number, nine out of 10 people. So we don't want to be like that. We want to have low levels of inflammation. So our thyroid functions optimally. We want to get our gut healthy. And we talked about this last week in the F MSG approach, which is the approach I share in my book, Preventable, Five Powerful Practices to Avoid Disease and Build Unshakable Health. You start with the food, right? Food first. And you can fortunately get plenty of iodine in your food if you do happen to like seafood like I do. If you can't and you may be low, of course, you can get the potassium iodide drops or the kelp tablets um, as well. And then av avoid the things that harm the thyroid, which in my experience has been the highly processed flours and grains like gluten, for example, has an anti-thyroid uh, uh, ability because it causes inflammation. It causes inflammation in the whole body and the brain, the hypothalamus that produces the initial TRH hormone. And of course, the thyroid gland itself that can cause inflammation. A lot of cases that I've seen actually started with issues with gluten and issues with grains causing inflammation. Later that triggered uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and then low thyroid. And so eliminating the grains and glutens and highly processed sugars and flours, and of course the seed oils too, eliminating those from the diet. Those are really the, the three I love to harp on. And then just eating real whole foods and you're going to be a uh, majority of the way there. And of course the F, the MSG, the M is the movement exercise improves thyroid function. And it's been well studied and it's one of my favorite things. So move your body every day. F, M, S, sleep is really important. Get optimal sleep because that helps with hormone regulation. G, we talked about that quite a bit today. The gut health portion, which is so important for that conversion 
from the thyroxin, which is the T4, into the active form, which is T3. Super important to optimize your gut health. That will help with your thyroid health. And that's been well studied as well. And then the final one is stress, FMSGs, and optimizing your stress will help tremendously with your thyroid function because we know that the converse, when your adrenals are just cranking out that cortisol, that cortisol actually will put a big damper on your thyroid function because that cortisol increases the production of the reverse T3, which is the brakes on the system. It basically competes with regular T3, which is the active form that gets your thyroid to do all that magic. The reverse T3 blocks all that because it basically looks identical. It's just a mirror image. And so stress will increase your T, your reverse T3. It also blocks that peripheral conversion from T4 to T3. It also decreases TSH. It decreases TRH. It causes significant inflammation, which messes with everything, right? The brain, the liver, the gut health. And so too much stress, no good, not just for the thyroid, but for so many things. And if you need help with that, reach out to me, read uh, my book. I have a whole section on stress optimization. I've done several podcasts in the past on stress as well. So I hope that's helpful for you. I hope this episode answered a bunch more of those questions and kind of solidified um, those questions about the levels, uh, about iodine, about goitrogens, about the treatment, about making sure that we're including T3 and T4, not just T4, because we can't assume that the peripheral conversion to the active form T3 is perfect because so many factors there with respect to the liver, with respect to the gut, with respect to stress and cortisol. We got to pay attention to these things and just remember that real food is the best place. So whole foods first, real food, food is medicine. And I would say that the best and most frequent medicine we could ever take is our food. So it starts with the food. And fortunately, there's so many helpful and healthful foods out there. Those that contain iodine are mostly in the fish and the seafood category that we talked about. Um, but if you don't like those, you can get the replacement. Like we talked about the iodine in kelp tablets or the potassium iodine drops, just not the Lugols because the Lugols is pretty potent. And to also make sure you're not eating those highly processed things, which can cause inflammation, which can wreak havoc on your gut, your liver, and of course, your thyroid gland. So I hope this is helpful for you. Make sure to share it out. Tag me. I would love to see it. I just love that you're spending the time with us each and every week to get this helpful health information out there to move the needle, to help you obtain optimal health and to thrive, not simply just survive. Aloha. Thanks for watching. And remember to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell so you never miss out. Aloha.